What exactly do you do right to ensure that 10 years on, you can still eat from the same brand? We need to ensure that this brand is as professional as it can be and anyone can work with the brand. Mm. There are several things that an artist needs to have for you to be commercially viable, mm. or rather for you to be a big brand, let me put it that way. Mm. So one, you need to have talent. Number two, you have to be very disciplined as an artist um, uh, and as an individual. So advantage of being in a label is you don't have to worry where you'll be tomorrow because there are people who are behind you and pushing your brand. You can have a million streams but earn very peanut, uh, peanuts. Mm. How is streaming money made? For, for artists, uh, streaming should not be your only revenue earner. Mm -hmm. If you rely, fully rely on streaming, then it's a very big stake, big, big stake you're doing. Good evening and welcome to the Late Night Business. My name is Ian Dennis and tonight as always we have a very interesting show lined up because you're going to be exploring the music business with a gentleman who's actually been in this particular industry for the last 10 years and he actually has his experience and accolades to show for it. But before I get to introduce my guest, I want to remind you that you're here at the Capital Club, the place you need to be as an entrepreneur because as all you see, your network is your net worth and being part of this particular club exposes you to a huge network of individuals both in the corporate and business world, not only locally but also across the world. As always, I also want to remind you that my book, Food for Thought, is actually out. You can actually get it at Nuria stores and you can also get it at Textbook Center and get to explore some of my thoughts. Literally, I just not, I'm not just a host. I have so many things to share and you can actually get to learn from this. So literally, Food for Thought, it just shares quotes on life and experiences that, that you can actually get to learn from. So the gentleman I'm actually speaking about, you've actually seen so many of his brands literally take over the airwaves and take over the music scene. I'm speaking about Mr. Dennis Njenga, who's the managing partner and co-founder of Kaka Empire, a leading music label here. They've actually gone into film and there's so much to explore. Dennis, thank you so much for having come to the show. Thank you for having me, Dennis. I was expecting you come with all the trophies. <laughs> Today we decided to be very simple. You should have told me when I did that. <laughs> Recently awarded to 40 under 40, yes. to 40 in Africa. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you so much. How does it feel that finally, before 40, before you, you've gotten all these things? Okay. It feels nice. Um, I've, I've been doing this for the last, uh, what, 13 years. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the thing I tell people is, as managers or people behind brands, we don't get enough recognition. So mm -hmm. when you recognize for the work you've done, mm -hmm. you feel proud of yourself. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. At the start of the conversation, the first question I like asking, what exactly are you most grateful for today? Today, uh, I, was, I, was, I was having a conversation with someone who was telling me I am at a place where I know what I want in life. So there is some sense of peace and happiness. So I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for having that peace and happiness that I have. Mm -hmm. yeah. What exactly is it that you want? Out of curiosity. <laughs> I just want, I'm a simple guy. I just want uh, happiness, peace. Um, how to uh, define that is um, as long as I have uh, friends around, I can talk to people, I can mentor, who look up to me, family who, mm -hmm. you know, keep joy within myself and my heart every single day, I'm, I'm good. Ah, interesting. Um, this, um, just going through your profile and your earlier beginnings, you grew up in, uh, what's it called, in humble beginnings. Yep. Uh, maybe you can just take us through your journey. Uh, in, where did you grow up? How exactly was some of, how did that particular, uh, what's it called, grow, growing up where you did, how did it have an influence to who you are today? Because I always know there's always some sense of semblance. Yeah. Yeah, so I grew up in Eastlands. I grew up in a place called uh, Pumwani. Uh, yeah, you know Pumwani Hospital? Yes, Pumu. Yeah, Pumu. <laughs> so my mom was a midwife. Uh, she used to assist my mother's give birth. Mm -hmm. And she was working at Pumwani. So we used to live with the servants' quarters in Pumwani maternity. So I g grew up in that area. Mm -hmm. Pumwani, Majengo, California, and Isili as itself it is. I, I went to both to primary school and high school in Isili. So I was at a, a school called Rescos Primary. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Isili Boys. Uh, so you just around Umta too? Around Umta, <laughs> yeah. But I, but I spent like two years at Isili Boys and then I think my dad saw the environment was not very good for me. I can be in So I was taken back to <laughs> some school very far in Kinango. <laughs> 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 and then... Uh, what was that doing? 
My dad, uh, yeah. my dad was a businessman. He used uh -huh. to own a printing company. Yeah. He used to do, used to do a bit of uh, fleet management for cars and matatus at some point. Fleet management. Yes. What's that? Fleet, fleet, fleet management. Manage yes, oh, yes, fleet yes, management. Fleet management. Yes, yes, yes. Ah. And so you've said your mom was a uh, midwife, midwife yep. and dad was in business. Yep. What are some of the lessons that you learned from your parents that when you look back in retrospect, that actually enabled you to be where you are today? Uh, most of the inspiration comes from my father. Uh, I used to look up to him a lot. Mm -hmm. um, every morning when he used to wake up to prepare for work, he would go and look at what he's doing. He used to have an afro, so he used to you know, comb his hair. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At some point, by the way, so yeah. sole insurance. Uh -huh. So he used to dress well, he used to have uh -huh. a briefcase. So I used to say, one day I'm going to be like this guy. Uh -huh. And I think he has a lot of influence in my life today, mm -hmm. uh, comparing to how I, I carry myself, I do my things. At mm -hmm. some point in my life, I've also done insurance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think my dad was big. My mom um, was a kind, good-hearted person. People used to come to our house all the time for advice to just sit and talk to her mm. so yeah so that's what i got from my parents interesting and what any any kind of aspirations you had when you you're growing up so because you've said dad was actually a big influence to you in terms of how exactly what exactly he was doing in terms of business you yourself what kind of aspirations did you have by that particular point so the funniest thing is uh, i had promised my mother i'm going to be a physiotherapist why? <laughs> I, I was just, I was and I mean, just, how did you know about physiotherapy growing up? I, I think I visited hospital once and I saw a signage written physiotherapy. <laughs> and asked my mom what's this and he told me oh, this, this is uh, all about bones and muscles and mm. all that. So I, I said, ah, I want to be that. I mm -hmm. want to be that. So yeah. I started, uh, you know, learning more about what happens, the human body and all that. So I kept that promise. Only one day, me, I'm going to be this, yeah. this, this person. Mm -hmm. You're going to, go to, to, to see me doing this. So he, when... He, we used to do rounds, or rather, when we used to do rounds in hospital of his uh, colleagues and friends, he used to introduce me to other physiotherapists. Uh, Tell me how this is. This, this boy wants to become like you one mm. day. Yeah. But uh, I guess life <laughs> teaches you different things. Now I'm in entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> and then after, so after going through, going to Kindangop, I believe that's where I did your high school. Yep. So you went to campus. What did you study? I studied uh, business administration at mm -hmm. uh, St. Paul's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then now I went into business. But before business, I know you also had some stint also in the corporate world. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I saw sometimes, I think from your profile, you sold insurance at one particular yep. point in time. Yeah. What kind of jobs you had after campus? So uh, my life was a bit um, disrupted at some point. So mm -hmm. what happened is um, I, I lost my mom when I was 13, oh, and sorry. then I lost my dad when I was 15. Ah. Uh, I am a fourth born in the family of five, so I have three older siblings, which are girls, mm -hmm. and then I have a younger brother mm -hmm. uh, who passed away two years ago. Oh, sorry. Uh, rest in peace. Yeah. Yeah. So I was uh, first male in the family. In the family. Yeah. So the things I had to do that uh, no one else could do. So mm -hmm. at the age of 15, I dropped out of school. So uh, I think I was in form two. Yeah. Uh, form two or going to form three. I dropped out of school, so I started working. Mm. Uh, at we 15? At 15, yeah. yeah. So we were living in a place called Kimende. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on Kimende, I know, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The cold place. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So I was doing very odd jobs. So I was carrying sacks uh, of gunias in the market. Mm -hmm. I was uh, doing um, washing bars and lodges. Just at 15? Yeah, at 15. Yeah. To fend for the family now? Exactly, yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. By that time, uh, my dad was uh, had not passed away. He was very unwell. Mm -hmm. uh, he had meningitis, so it had oh. really eaten him up. Um, mm. So, the whole, my whole year at 15 was very hard because mm -hmm. I had to feed my dad, feed the other guys. My, my small bro was still in primary school. Luckily, that time, Kibaki had introduced free primary, primary school, yeah. so he was, he was able to go. And I remember I, 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 I stayed for close to two years without going to school, wow. just doing that. Mm -hmm. And then luckily enough, uh, I have an older sister who lives in uh, abroad. So she came and asked me, what do you want? Do you want me to start a business for you? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to, what help do you need? I, I just mm -hmm. told him, I need, I need to go back to school. Mm -hmm. So I remember he gave me some money, told me, go, go look for a school. So I went to the nearest school, which was Kimende High School. Yeah. And I had to... Uh, repeat classes so I went back to form two mm -hmm. and that's now how I finished my high school and the good thing is there were bursaries mm -hmm. and um, scholarships that uh, there's a company there called Kabasi it's normally mines carbon dioxide it's mm -hmm. with uh, bursaries to kids who mm -hmm. are doing very well mm -hmm. so I ensure that I'm always in the top three in every stream ah, so, so I can get, get the scholarship exactly and how pivotal was that particular period when you look back in retrospect because it was just 15 yep. you've lost all your parents you literally have to stand in the gap of your parents mm -hmm. 
when you look back in in retrospect how was that particular period how did it shape you so i normally tell guys i think i jumped a space in a, a stage in my life mm. because i had to mature in a very young age mm. um working at that age mm. fighting for my family looking for things to do uh looking for jobs mm. so i had to learn how to live life at a very young age mm -hmm. so i think it has had a very big impact to who i am today mm -hmm. because if you look at uh people at my age uh, rather in my 20s when i was talking mm. to my 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 peers when i was working them they were in school when mm. i was trying to get back to campus mm. they were out having fun with their life so yeah. i i feel there's a stage in my life i passed but mm. it is good because it really shaped the way i looked at life i look at life today if i didn't go through what i went through then i don't know if i'll be here today mm -hmm. yeah having gone through that particular period because i know it's not quite an easy period So you went to campus uh, after going through campus what are some of the earlier jobs that you also got yourself into So so I went to campus while I was working um what happened is um uh at, I got employed when I was 19 mm -hmm. uh, in, in my official corporate job I got employed at NIC bank uh, this days is SNBA mm -hmm. NCBA bank yeah. and I was I was employed as a salesman so I used to sell uh, So it's oh bank accounts accounts credit yeah. cards mm -hmm. loans so mm -hmm. that was my job mm -hmm. um So I worked there for 4 years and then I got poached by a colleague of, or rather a, a, a mentor of mine mm -hmm. and his name is Ezekiel Ward he mm -hmm. used to be the general manager at Sunlam then yeah. um, it was called Pan Africa Life mm -hmm. now Sunlam yeah. uh, as a unit manager so now from management from just being a, a, a salesman yeah. now to doing something in insurance and that's mm -hmm. how my my corporate life was structured there's always something about people in insurance yeah <laughs> you always say people in insurance are people who have actually mastered sales yeah so how was your stint as an insur insurance sales person mm -hmm. how exactly or what are some of the things around sales that you learned at that particular point so let me let me take you back to banking mm -hmm. um then now i can i can tell it, about it, it. insurance so, yes. yes so banking um remember i'm 19 mm -hmm. i've never done any corporate job I'm told now you need to go start talking about money and how to save and tell guys about bank accounts. And you don't look it. I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to learn. Yeah. The good thing is uh so we had two categories of uh, uh employees, new employees who came in. So mm. there were guys who came from then Barclays was big. Mm. So there was a lot of sales people pushed from Barclays mm. to come and join the sales force at uh, at NIC bank. Yeah. And then now there are new, now fresh guys mm. out of maybe campus, school yeah. and campus who joined banking. Mm -hmm. So I used to, what I did I paired myself with someone who's done sales before mm -hmm. and that person used to sell credit cards mm -hmm. me as you sell accounts. Mm -hmm. So all so when we attack a client that's the word we used to use. <laughs> he introduces credit cards me introduce an account because you have they have to go yeah, hand together hand. hand in hand. Yep. So what happened what used to happen and um um it was it was it has it actually sort of cemented my experience in sales is we used to have a boss by that is called um, he's called Meshak Miyogo. Mm. Uh he's now the general manager at sales insurance. So Meshak used to put us in a van. All of you or nyinyi watu wote wa sales ingeni hapo ndani. Get into a van, he takes you to by that let's say Riverside Drive or Lamington. There are no matatus by then. Mm. Those sides matatus are only playing the main routes. He drops you somewhere on the road, tells you from here to that point go knock in every door. I want you back in the office at 4. That is at 7:30 in the morning. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you walk. You walk. So that taught you endurance. That mm. taught you persistence. That taught you how to doing door to door. Door to door. And try to talk to yes. everybody try to yes. have them open account. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, so so that sort of uh, Uh, taught us how to become sales people. Mm -hmm. So within three months of mm -hmm. doing that repeatedly every single day of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, so five days in a week, Monday to Friday. By the time it was three months we were pros. Mm -hmm. We knew I could look at you and tell you ah you you are a joker. You can't give me anything. <laughs> so I won't waste waste time with you as a client. <laughs> Let me go to the next person. Mm -hmm. Um so uh, I can say I did very well at NIC Bank. Mm -hmm. Um I think I I I became one of the top sales people there mm -hmm. um got a lot of awards i was uh, given an opportunity to also lead a team so i became a team leader so mm -hmm. a team was compromising of between 15 to about 20 team members mm -hmm. so i now i had my own sales mm -hmm. team uh, mm -hmm. to 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 do the same and that's now where pan africa noticed what i was doing mm -hmm. and isaac elwor poached me from banking now to insurance, insurance. yeah 
insurance uh, when I went to Pan Africa is because of the type of clients I was dealing with. I was dealing with uh, high clientele clients. Mm. So we formed a, a unit or the plan bill called uh, Premier. So mm. we used to target clients who can save uh, premiums from between, I think, 10 to 50,000 a month mm -hmm. comfortably. Yeah. And that was our main job. So we had a whole, I was a branch manager. So I had a whole, so yeah. branch comprises of several teams, of mm. team leaders who have other team members within. So it was that's the structure. Yeah. And through that particular experience, what did you learn about sales? Because I know sales in any particular business is the most important thing. What did you learn about sales? Uh, uh, sales is a... Uh, Sales is like preaching. You see those preachers you meet on the road? They're the best preachers. Yes. <laughs> okay, kumbia, well, yes, wanakuja kesho, lazima yeah. wokoke. Mm -hmm. And you look at this guy wondering, why is this guy shouting with a speaker and a microphone? Mm -hmm. So, sales is like that. Mm -hmm. You are, insurance, you are selling a promise. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, uh, if your child gets to the age of 13, this mm -hmm. is what you're going to earn. Mm -hmm. So, I'm selling you a promise. You don't know if you're also, you're yeah. going to get a child mm -hmm. one. You don't know if that child is going to get there. Mm -hmm. Um compared to banking where you're actually selling tangible a tangible product. If it's a credit card, here's your card. If yeah. it's your account, here's your account. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned a lot of uh, people management skills. I learned a lot of um, how to read a lot of uh, uh, personalities and how to deal with different people. Mm -hmm. But the greatest thing is it exposed me to a lot of people in different industries. Mm -hmm. So I knew a lot of people, engineers and doctors. So yeah, I learned a lot. Interesting. Yeah. And at what particular point now did you decide now to leave the corporate life uh, and primarily everything that comes with it now to transition into now biz uh, business and primarily with your friend King Kaka? Mm -hmm. How was that particular decision and how did you decide it's a different, you're in insurance, you're in banking, now you want to go into the music business? Uh, so uh, the interesting bit is when I was initially boys, we were, with, we were desk with King Kaka, so mm -hmm. we went to the same high school. Yeah. And at some point, I was also a rapper, so I used to rap. You used uh, to rap? Yeah. <laughs> All uh, right, interesting. Uh -huh. so you can still drop lines. Uh, uh, or the lines dropped you. They dropped me, man. <laughs> so those, those years, what we used to do at Isili Boys, used to organize what we call rap battles. Mm -hmm. Then we charge guys 20 bob. So I think that's where our business sort of um, our way of doing things started. So you charge people to come see you rap? Yes. No, we, we organize a battle, like uh, people contest, and mm -hmm. then for you to enter, uh, you we charge you like 20 bob. And then yeah. the winner? The winner gets a, a bit of the money. And then you guys eat the rest. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. the, then the funniest thing was, um, uh, Kaka was a better rapper than I, so I used to ensure that I'm one of the judges. So I sort of influence who wins and who doesn't win. The So the ABC chairman. Yeah, you can say that, yeah. So I was there influencing things. So uh -huh. we started music, I can say, in Isili Boys, was mm. a lot of influence. Isili Boys, by the way, has, has, has uh, brought out so many guys. Uh, mm. You know Tejo Josiah, Tejo mm. Josiah was at Isili Boys. Been here. Uh, yes. DJ Sadiq was at Isili Boys. Ah, uh -huh. Echo Dida was at Isili ah, Boys. Uh -huh. A lot of artists uh, have come out from Isili Boys. So I think also the environment, the culture there was very artistic friendly for us. Mm. So we learned a lot. Mm -hmm. But now at some point, Nika Mwambia, my friend, me, I can do this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, let me venture into other things. Yeah. So fast forward, when I went to banking and insurance, I learned a lot on how to structure companies and mm -hmm. how to run businesses, mm -hmm. from how I could see them doing businesses. Mm -hmm. So when I was in insurance, I think uh, two years in, we started earning some revenue from Kaka himself, or mm -hmm. rather from, um, from the brand Kaka, King mm -hmm. Kaka. And now we formed Kaka Empire. And so primarily you used to still help him, what's it called, manage him yep. while still working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, cause I remember I used to do my 8 to 5. And the good thing with sales is, you know, a salesman, you're always in the field. Yeah. So I used to get some time to do these things. Mm. Uh, 8 to 5, Monday to Friday, weekends we, get, we do shows. We're all over the, mm. the country doing shows. Monday I'm in the office with my suit and tie, selling mm. insurance. And then so, over the weekend now you're the manager? Exactly. All right, so uh -huh. we used to jungle with him. So the, the learnings I got from banking and insurance is what now enabled me to create structures like Kaka Empire. Mm -hmm. So when we started making our first revenue, I knew there's something here. And if you take this thing seriously and structure it in a proper way, we're actually going to make milk and bread from this. Mm -hmm. and that's how Kaka Empire evolved. Mm -hmm. So three years into insurance, I knew now this is now where I want to go. Mm -hmm. And now I started setting structures in a way where in case I'm ready to exit any time, I'll be able to concentrate sustain. fully on this and it's yeah. going to sustain my life mm -hmm. and both of us as, 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 as people. So, four years in, I pushed in my resignation, mm -hmm. I left insurance mm -hmm. and I fully focused on Kaka Empire. Interesting. And what did you think 
at what okay you mentioned you stayed four years before now you can now sing the real substance in the brand yep during that particular period how was it called what are the key elements that you did to start seeing this revenue because i know sometimes being as an as an artist usually takes a while for some people mm -hmm. how did you start seeing this particular revenue was it because of the songs that were released or what happened yeah so i'll tell you something about kaka's brand uh, how we built king kaka was this uh, by that time it was called rabbit mm, i remember yeah. with uh, the white the bean, yeah. i remember i was in high school one day and then uh -huh. i'd gone for is it chagula timis uh -huh. and then he was there i think he was introduced by chihuahua Ah, I remember it quite fondly. I yeah, was in form a, two. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> used to be a backup uh, rapper for Chihuahua. Chihuahua, I remember yeah, quite well. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Kenyan, Kenyan content or music was being consumed very differently from how it is now, mm -hmm. then. Then radio was everything. So if mm. your song is played on radio, mm. you're the biggest artist. And then, how artists used to do it is they release one song one year, for one year. So mm -hmm. one song sustains you for 12 months. Mm. Napata, for example, uh, maybe Nameless or Nini releases a song and they will perform that song from January to December mm -hmm. but then so there's a very small niche of artists who are earning maybe from gigs or any corporate deals that are coming through that channel mm -hmm. and also the consumer the listeners who are consuming the music were very limited in, in terms of the music they're listening to mm -hmm. so what we did is we decided to create demand for our music instead of going to fight for that small piece of cake that is there. So one thing we did was uh, we sort of had a collaboration or some sort of agreement with street DJs. But then, back then, Matatus were very big. Mm. Uh, number nine, number four, mm. uh, Buruburu, mm. 58. They were very big and they used to fully rely on street DJs. So if you go to that street for Menti Tomboya, a lot of DJs cropped out from there. So they used to make mixes and then they give the mixes on CDs to Matatus and then Matatus play it all, all, all day long. So what we did is uh, we approached, I remember there was a guy, a DJ called Lex or Lexus, mm -hmm. there was DJ Mantix, they're very big DJs. So what we what we're doing is we give them, uh, for example, we had a song called Jam Nakam. Mm -hmm. We tell DJ Mantix, I want you to play this song in the beginning of your mix, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the middle of this mix, and then at the end, play it twice. Mm -hmm. So, in every mix you do that. In every, regardless whether it's a reggae mix, whether it's a hip hop mix, a local mix, please do that. I'm going to jam. jam. And then uh, the other thing is we printed stickers. So uh -huh. we used to put stickers on Matatus. Mm -hmm. Stickers with the lines of the lyrics the to lyrics, the song. Yeah. Uh -huh. So when you you see on the side Niko Kwa Jam na Kam or something that Kaka said. Mm -hmm. So when you see uh, or listen to the music on the Matatu, you can resonate with what is written there. Mm -hmm. So we sort of started growing a fan base. Mm -hmm. Then there was no Facebook, there was no yeah. Instagram, there was no Twitter. Mm -hmm. What people used to do, they used to call radio stations to request the songs. So the calls started coming in. And I remember that, and then, but, then, but, that but that time, uh, Ghetto Radio was big. Mm -hmm. Or rather it has just started and guys were very excited about it. So they used to get a lot of calls of guys requesting for Jam yeah. And that's how we became Grabbit now. Jam that can became big. Yeah. That's why you saw it at Chagola TV. Yes, I remember. And all that. Yeah. In interesting. Yeah. yeah. So we created demand for music. All right. Interesting. Yeah. So we're going to take a short commercial break. So I said to go jam, but to come to very soon. I'll see you after the break. <laughs> So welcome back to the show. We had taken a short commercial break, but we were back. But before we went on a break, uh, Dennis was just taking us through that particular nemesis of how exactly King Kaka came to be, how exactly got his breakthrough, what are some of the tactics that he did. And so from this particular point now, you, King Kaka is being known. Now you've decided to make this particular transition now from just full-time job now to becoming a manager. How are the initial years in terms of now building a brand and making it sustainable? Because that's also one of our core things. What exactly do you do right to ensure that 10 years on, you can still eat from the same brand? Um, <clears throat> so how we saw things then was uh, artists used to come and go, brands yeah. used to come and go, uh, and uh, they were all fully relying on gigs or other live performances. 
So what we did differently and what we introduced differently at Kaka Empire was we wanted to see, apart from just me being on stage and performing as an artist, what else can I do to ensure I earn a revenue? So now, now what I'm telling you now is now the structure that mm. we put in place. Mm -hmm. So one thing we needed to ensure is we need to ensure that this brand is as professional as it can be and anyone can work with the brand. Mm. And um, case study, let's, let's, let's even talk about Let's even take King Kaka. Yeah. So we had we, we this the, the the direction we went with King Kaka's brand was ensure, we ensured that King Kaka is a household name. Um, I remember at the time I sat with the CEO for Bitco and uh, he was telling me that their aim as Bitco is to ensure that when you walk into anyone's home, mm -hmm. there's a Bitco product in every single room that you go in. Mm -hmm. And that's now how we started King Kaka to make him a household name. What do I mean is if you are in your 20s, you can listen to his music. Mm. If you're in your 50s, you can listen to his music. If you're in your uh, 30s, you can mm. listen to So you can resonate with everyone. And that ensures that even if um, any company wants to work with you as a brand, they don't look at you as a, a brand or product that is only uh, suited for a small niche of people, mm. but you're suited for a whole um, a sort of uh, following of guys. Uh, so we created structure. So apart from live gigs, we looked at now how can we get endorsements, how can we get um, partnerships with other co corporate companies. And then number two, apart from that now, you as a person, you as a brand, so you as Ian, mm. the, the artist, how are you as a person? How, in terms of your personal growth, are you growing? Mm. So what I do personally with all my brands is I ensure that as we grow your brand, also you as an individual you grow because music business is like uh, we actually compare it to uh, a tout a makanga mm. it's like a makanga unapewa pesa leo mm. unapewa una pesa kesho you, you use it yeah. today use it tomorrow so if you're not able to plan yourself very well you won't have it in the next mm -hmm. one year mm -hmm. so how are you as an individual are you able to invest to grow put things aside to ensure that you grow uh, at an individual level as you grow from just being an individual who's in your 20s to an individual in your 30s now starting a family, are you able to sustain your family with your brand? Yeah, so yeah. that's how we structure things. And something about the music business, because you've been in it for during the era of CDs, now in yeah. the era of streaming, yeah. uh, and so much has actually changed, but you've managed to be in all these particular eras. How has it, what's it called, how have you managed to make this transition? Because initially, no used to sell CDs, yeah. now in the era of streaming, and how, first of all, how do you compare both these two eras in terms of the digital era and the physical era? And how is money being made now, apart from shows, which is actually the main medium in which artists make money? Mm -hmm. uh, Revenue-wise, um, we are earning more money right now compared so to... So you earn more through streaming than you used to do yes. through CDs? There was no streaming then. Back then. Yeah, yeah, but you used to sell CDs physically. Yeah, but uh -huh. you, you, can't, you can't track, you can't... You mm -hmm. don't, it's, it's just, it was complicated. Yeah. Um, you have to rely on third parties, or third parties are... Hustlers like you, they don't mm. have structures in place. Mm. But right now with streaming and the digital sort of um, um, uh, creation of things, things have become, you you know, you, you can get data anytime you want. Mm. You can know who's listening to me at yeah. what time, where, in which city, and all that. So it's, it's really good. And then uh, it has created a platform where everyone can access your music, mm. which again, of course, revenue also is distributed among so many people mm. across the world. Yeah. And how is money made? Because I know that's the biggest uh, here. I follow a lot of conversations whereby you can have a million streams but earn very peanut, earn peanuts. Mm -hmm. I don't know from you because you've sat in the back end. How is streaming money made? Maybe f how much can you make for maybe a million streams? Because mm -hmm. I know that's always another big conversation. People say like, yeah, I can have a lot of streams but I don't have money. I think it was also the Snoop Dogg conversation the other day yeah. where you're saying like he has a billion streams yeah. but the money that comes with it yeah. is that is not does not match that. Yeah, so streaming is, um, for, for artists, uh, streaming should not be your only revenue earner. Mm -hmm. uh, if you rely, fully rely on streaming, then it's a very big stake, big, big stake you're doing. Uh, the other, you should look at other revenues, of uh, other ways of running your revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is true, streaming gives you a small percentage of what you earn. So you'll hear someone says, I have got a million views on YouTube, I only earn 10,000. Yes, that's, yes. Yeah, so it's, it varies. Mm. Uh, it varies. There are so many things I look at mm -hmm. and they give you a percentage of that because they're also in business. Mm. So they also need to earn. Mm. Um, the, 
the sense of the, the, the whole essence of having now streaming platforms and uh, platforms where guys can access your content digitally is to ensure that your content is exposed to a larger mass of people compared to now the selected few that you can go to every mm. single day. Mm. Yeah. So streaming, yes, is there, but um, you should look at endorsements, you should look at uh, performances. Mm. Um, these days, artists are also doing influencing. Mm. Um, you should look at uh, merchandising. There are several ways you can earn a revenue. Mm. Yeah. Also, the whole key to is just expanding your revenue streams. Exactly, exactly. You've built quite a number of brands. I think we just went through the list early on before we started this recording. Femi One, uh, King Kaka, Avril, just to mention but a few. Yep. With all these particular brands and from your experience, what does it take for an artist to build a brand that's commerci commercially viable? Uh, we can take a case study out of all these particular brands. Mm -hmm. Let's say Arubo, you started out with him from scratch. Yep. How does, what was the process towards making him commercially viable? Uh, so how we we discovered Arrow Boy was through his previous uh, song he had done, a release. So, but let me let me um, change the conversation a bit. Mm -hmm. So, there are several things that an artist needs to have for you to be commercially viable, mm -hmm. or rather, for you to be a big brand. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. So, one, you need to have talent. So, talent is key. So, like me, I couldn't rap, <laughs> so I, I said let me clear it out. So that kept me out. Yeah. Number two, you have to be very disciplined as an artist um, uh, and as an individual. So how do you do your work? Mm -hmm. Are you able to get to studio on time? Are you able to record things on time? Um, you know, you know, mm -hmm. uh, household uh, rules. Number three, um, you also have to be very hardworking and consistent in what you do. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I interact with a lot of artists every single day. They are in my inbox, they're in my DMs asking questions. And what you could see is, at some point within the journey, they sort of lose lose interest or rather lose faith in the journey that they're going through. So you need to be very persistent and consistent in what you do. Mm -hmm. Then number four, Manze, you need to have God. Mm -hmm. Music is hard, mm -hmm. um, even in business. Music, uh, business is hard, so you need to have God with you. So um, there are stages an artist goes through. One, we call it the discovery stage. You've done a hit song, mm. it's big. Then you can become a big artist by that. But now, those artists, it is very hard for them to sustain their brand long term. You need to be very, very um, particular in what you do and careful in what you do to ensure that your brand lasts long term. And I can give you a million examples of artists. If you, even if you look at the previous genre, Gengeton, a lot of artists came out. Mm -hmm. A lot of them. Yeah. They became big songs, they were doing very many shows across Kenya. But right now they are nowhere to be seen. Mm. Because they did not realize is that was not they, they, had, they were not there yet. Although it seemed they were there, it, it, it meant that they needed to start working. Mm. Um, number two mm. is what we call uh, luck. Or you can say God. Mm. You now God ensures that you are able to sustain your brand. So the artists too, by just luck, they sort of mm. blend in with people and yeah. become big. Mm -hmm. But then we also have the, uh, the other category of artists who need to work hard. They have to, they have to work hard every single day and mm -hmm. if they sleep a day, we forget about them. Mm -hmm. So as an artist, you need to know where you are. Uh, but it doesn't mean that if you have a hit song or you have that luck that you've got an, an endorsement or two here mm -hmm. or uh, you worked hard and you are where you are today, it doesn't mean that you stop working. It mm -hmm. has to be a continuous process to the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you've had your luck, you've had your hit song, you're yeah. now there. Another question is in terms of now determining your worth. So as an artist, maybe as a manager, how do you determine an artist's worth? Maybe let's say for an influencer gig or maybe for events, how do you determine an artist's worth? Uh, so there are different things. We look at your target audience mm -hmm. or people who consume your music. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at their age, we mm -hmm. look at their location. Mm -hmm. uh, we also look at the general of music mm -hmm. that you do. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you cannot value as an artist who does jazz the same way you value an artist who does uh, gangeto. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is you look at your following. Mm -hmm. I may have a million following. But people can buy following. Yeah, yeah but there are, you know, you can know. <laughs> you can know, but you can always yeah. know, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. um, you may have a million following, I have mm -hmm. 250, so I, of course I can't charge the same way I charge yeah. or, or value my, my red cards. The other thing is also influence. Influence is big. People don't know this, but uh, 
the artist I'll give an example like Jokali Jokali mm. has a lot of influence mm. although you won't see him maybe in your top 10 hit songs today you won't see him but he has a lot of influence if he goes to a show in uh, Eldoret people will come and mm. people are going to sing a line by line of mm. the songs so he has a lot of influence same with Kaka same mm. with Kali they have a lot of influence but you won't have them getting you hit songs every single day mm-hmm. uh and then also number the other thing is apart from you just being an artist what other things are you doing mm. um the artists to activists the artists who are health champions the artists to do other th- things apart from just the music so mm. all those things vary in terms of how you value your art mm-hmm. yeah and then there's also this other debate in terms of uh, being uh, how is it called being signed to a label and also being independent mm-hmm. um you've dealt with artists on both particular ends how how do you compare both of them and especially in this particular modern day and age does it make sense to be part of a label uh so and also another question mm-hmm. sorry sorry i'm putting so many questions i'm yeah. very curious yeah. and what does it also take to be part of a label okay so for your first question so the essence of having a label mm-hmm. behind your brand mm-hmm. is basically having a team that does the work for you mm-hmm. when you're not there compared to you doing it yourself if you're an um uh, an artist who's not signed you do everything you're mm. the manager you're the dj you're the producer you're, you're the accountant you're the pr so you sort of do all those things mm. but the privilege you get when you are in a label is you get all these things served to you mm. so you get someone who works on your media lesson for example you mm. when you spoke to me you spoke to kadambi yeah you cuz Kadambi is our head of PR and marketing mm-hmm. uh, communication sorry mm-hmm. you have someone who does social media mm-hmm. so we have a social media uh, uh, person called Sharon who does that we have a road manager who takes you for gigs and sure that when you get to a gig everything is in place mm-hmm. uh, we have a guy called Brian uh, then you have now an accountant you have a creative manager you have so the essence of being in a label is you have people mm-hmm. who fight for mm-hmm. you and when when you're not when you're not uh, there or other people who give you the assistance that you require and mm-hmm. keep that wheel rolling mm-hmm. when you're not there now in Kenya the way labels are you can compare them with how labels are maybe in Nigeria yeah. or mm-hmm. in the US mm-hmm. or in the western countries because we've sort of not formed structures and the majority of the labels you see in Kenya and I'm not being biased in any way is they're not labels they're studios mm-hmm but they call come record yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what they do is they'll tell you is uh we'll give you the recording session for free mm. or rather you pay half of this uh, amount then we'll keep the other half in terms of percentage to your master mm. or your song ownership mm. so th- those are studios mm-hmm. but a label a label should offer these things that I've talked about they should mm-hmm. offer all the other things mm-hmm. um so advantage of being in a label is you don't have to worry where you'll be tomorrow because there are people who are behind you and pushing your brand if you are an individual now those are the things you have to worry like mm-hmm. when we started mm-hmm. with king kaka rabbit we used to worry every day where are we going to get our next gig who's going to call this number who's going to follow up with this client but for a label now you have people doing that for you mm-hmm. yeah yeah and also another subject in terms of now music is the element of the split sheet i always hear it a lot when you're yeah. doing music there's a split sheet What does a split sheet entail and why exactly is it important for artists also just to embrace the element of split sheets? So a split sheet is more or less like a legal document uh, highlighting who owns what in that that asset mm-hmm. uh, being the music. So who's the, who owns the producing rights, who owns the master rights, who owns the performing rights. So what's the producing the rights? rights? So the producer of mm-hmm. course mm-hmm. owns the So the producer is the one who owns the producing yes. rights, the yes. master rights? The master rights you could own as an artist mm-hmm. or if maybe the producer sort of gave you a discount on the producing fee mm-hmm. or something like that they mm-hmm. could own part of it mm-hmm. labels normally own full master rights mm-hmm. or they also own part of the so master rights what's the difference between a master and the producing rights uh master rights are ownership of the actual song mm-hmm. so oh, the actual song that yes. goes out. that's the master yes uh uh-huh. so how you own the master rights is who who is the executive like movies mm-hmm. you've seen executive producers yes. So the producer basically means I funded and ensured that this project started and ended mm. fully without any 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 challenges. Mm-hmm. So now that's how labels work. Mm-hmm. So if for example if you go to Sony or um, all the labels there mm-hmm. they own fully your master rights. They'll come and tell you I'm giving an advance of a million shillings. Mm-hmm. Uh this, this is just for you. Yes. 
and then uh, I want you to do an album, a 12 track album, mm -hmm. and I'm going to fund it fully, and I'm going to put money in marketing, mm -hmm. money in publishing, money in PR, money, mm -hmm. all those. Mm -hmm. But I own fully the master rights mm -hmm. for a certain time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of a split sheet, so as an artist, what what what's usually now the the splitting? How do you split it, and how do you know how much it is that you're supposed to get out of it? Is it through this the streaming, mm -hmm. or is it through the events? How does it work? So it's across everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just how you you, you study the project with. So mm -hmm. there's the producer, mm -hmm. there's the artist who actually performed. Yeah. Uh, sorry, recorded. Yes. Then there's a performer. Uh, so the artist could be different from the performer. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's also, these days are also writers. Mm -hmm. so writers also have a oh, share. Oh, those have a share? Yes, of the split. And how do you track it? Because it's the artist who will perform it, who will upload it on the platform. Mm -hmm. How do you track it? Or maybe I wrote that song, yeah. or I produced this song. How will they know how much I earn out of it? So what, what we normally tell mm -hmm. guys is ensure that you're a member of uh, publishing companies mm -hmm. and all those, so that you they give you a special number. Mm -hmm. So when I'm uploading my song on yeah. the digital uh, streaming platforms, mm -hmm. they'll ask me. Are you the main artist? Are you the performer? Mm -hmm. Are you a writer? So I'm able to put all those detail, details down. Mm -hmm. and I'm also able to put the percentage you've agreed on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's no standard percentage. Mm -hmm. it's just how you agree with that person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And something quite interesting that I checked out is that now you you're literally diversifying now into Isokaka films. And the other day, congratulations on the monkey business. Thank you. Um, what exactly informed this particular transition? Uh, so you know, with music, music is purely storytelling. Mm -hmm. If you listen to any song. They are telling a story or telling you about something that has happened in their lives. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, heavily, uh, if you look at our videos, uh, we've heavily mm -hmm. invested in storytelling. Mm -hmm. So we saw there's an opportunity in film and that's why we went into film. Because we feel one, it, uh, it correlates or go hand in hand with music. Mm -hmm. And since we've already established and done music the right way, mm -hmm. and things are good that end, that we can venture into now turning the music into movies and stories. Mm -hmm. Our first uh, release was Come to Pay. It's now yeah, on YouTube, I saw by it, the yeah. way. Actually, yeah. I saw it. Interesting, yeah. yeah. And if you look at the concept to use a Come to Pay, is we've merged film and music. Music, yeah. So you'll see a, a, a certain scene at some point, there's a performance of a song. Mm -hmm. So, same way. Uh, monkey business is a bit different. There's no mix of music and um, uh, performance of music and film, but we blended a lot of music within the. The, the, the whole series. Mm -hmm. It's actually a four episode series. Mm -hmm. When is it coming out? Oh, or oh, oh, how is it called? Where can we watch? We, we, our person could not attend the, how is it called? Uh -huh. The launch, but when exactly is it coming out? Where can we buy it? Where can we watch it? Soon, soon, soon it's going to be available to the public. Mm -hmm. What we did was uh, sort of a, a screening for mm -hmm. people who are interested and especially yeah. people in the film. And it's all just sector. one episode? Yes. Uh -huh. we, only sh we actually showed the fourth episode, the mm -hmm. last episode of the but soon it will be available to uh, everyone. Yeah, we're oh, going to announce. Yeah, interesting. And also another interesting thing about you is that you're in, you're in philon philanthropy. Yeah. And it's so quite a number of things that you're actually working or that you're involved in. Yep. Why is philanthropy important to you? Uh, I think growing up as an orphan, mm -hmm. um, we used to get a lot of handouts from uh, NGOs, mm -hmm. uh, from people. Mm -hmm. So I know what. Uh, especially young kids go through mm -hmm. when they don't have anyone to feed them, uh, look for food for them. As I told you my story, I mm -hmm. started working when I was 15, mm -hmm. so I know. And how I do the philanthropy bit is I have structured each and every brand that we have at Kaka Empire, mm -hmm. especially the big brands, uh, to be able to give back to the community. For example, Kaka has uh, the sanitary bank campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, he has given sanitary towels to more than 50,000 girls across the country. Oh, yeah. uh, it's gone to about seven counties across. Yeah. Uh, for Femi One, she has um, a foundation called the One for One Foundation. Mm -hmm. It's doing the same thing, apart from distributing sanitary towels, she, has, she also does food distribution and uh, mentorship for young girls. Mm -hmm. uh, Kaka Empire, we have, we've been running um, a, a program called Dreams Campaign from mm -hmm. very many years ago when we were in high school. Mm -hmm. And what we do is visit kids in privileged uh, societies mm -hmm. and uh, homes and all that and you feed them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's a big part, not only for me as Dennis, but mm -hmm. Kaka Empa as a label, mm -hmm. because uh, we all grew in, uh, yeah. Kaka grew in Shaurimoyo, mm -hmm. uh, Kuala mm -hmm. Femi grew in Wiki. Mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't come from Runda or uh, Karen, no? So we know, we know what people in these areas go through, that's mm -hmm. why you're giving back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Looking back at your journey, because you've You've been, you've experienced the lowest of low, you've experienced the highs of highs. What are some of the key lessons that you can actually say you carry out of life? 
because you lost your parents by 15, you had to become a parent by at 15, you've lost it and you've tried to rebuild it and you've experienced the higher side. When you just look back at your life, just looking back, what exactly are some of the lessons that you can say you can recount mm -hmm. and are very, very pivotal for any person watching this and maybe aspiring to be where you are, can actually learn from? Um, one is there's always time for everything and everyone has their own time. Mm. It doesn't mean that because I am doing well today mm. and I have, you seem like I have mm. everything going on, right? Yeah. Um, it, that your time is not there. Mm -hmm. So your time will always come mm. and what is yours is yours. Mm. Um, I believe I'm a very, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian so I believe in God. Mm -hmm. I believe God normally knows the right time to bring things forth. Mm. Number two, um, what I've learned is um, um, about three years ago, I, I, I weighed, I was like 95 kgs, I was mm -hmm. very big. Mm -hmm. so, You're fat. You saw me, I was fat. <laughs> yeah, I, didn't, I, was, I, didn't I, was, I was fat now. You're plus size. I was plus size. Yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. I used to be very big. Uh -huh. um, and I came from 95 hmm. to about 65 hmm. within a year. How did you do? Uh, I started exercising. Uh, how good a life was actually? Ah, <laughs> kukula uh, vizuri. Started. Uh, I I I don't take sugar at all. Mm -hmm. Not sugar at all. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I take a lot of uh, a lot of proteins and mm -hmm. very kidogo carbs mm -hmm. in my meals. Mm -hmm. So I I changed my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So my my point is th during that process mm -hmm. is I learned what consistency is. Mm -hmm. So during my journey in life consistency has been one key thing that mm -hmm. I've always um, put in place. Mm -hmm. During my sales time stint, and doing mm -hmm. sales and mm -hmm. selling banking stuff and selling insurance, mm -hmm. consistency is everything. And mm -hmm. even in your normal life, mm -hmm. uh, whether in regards of what you want to achieve, mm -hmm. whether you are a host, talks mm -hmm. to host, whether you are an artist, whether you are a, a footballer or mm -hmm. anything, if you're consistent in everything you do, you are destined for greatness. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that will stop you. Um, then lastly, hmm. uh, there is a big power in the power of a positive mind and attitude. Hmm. So if you don't have that, my friend, hmm. you're not going anywhere. Hmm. So you always, I was listening to someone who was saying, I'm a very big fan of uh, podcast. Hmm. Uh, I listen to Vusi. Hmm. You know Vusi? Hmm. Yeah, a very big fan. So what he talks about is if you perceive when you see yourself as a CEO, start behaving like one. Hmm. If you want to buy a car and you mm. when you walk every day to work, start behaving like you have a car. Mm. So yeah, the power of a positive mind. Interesting. So before you end, I have like mm -hmm. 10 quick questions, quick fire questions. So answer the first thing that comes to your mind. What's the greatest risk you've ever taken? Quitting employment to get into business. Which is your favorite word? Uh, my favorite word? Uh, pass. Hmm? I don't remember. So come to come to <laughs> <laughs> Describe your style in one word. Uh, Professional. What is one of your nicknames? Uh, my, I have one nickname. Mm -hmm. the people call me Kamlish. Uh, yeah. Sipat me. <laughs> yeah, sip <at> me. <laughs> what is your hidden talent? I write. I write a lot. Uh, I, have a, I have a blog. Mm -hmm. yeah, I write okay. a lot. Even if you look at my social media pages, yeah. you'll notice. Yeah. Money or happiness? Happiness, man. Are you more of an introvert or an extrovert? Introvert. Are you more of a thinker or a doer? Thinker. What's your go-to snack? Uh, meat. Any type of meat, but fish. Uh, Best. So that's why you do your meeting. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> what scares you? Uh, nothing, man. At what age do you want to retire? I was to retire at 35, but now I'm two years late, uh -huh. so I'm 40. What's been your best age? Uh, 30. Who inspires you? Um, who inspires me? Uh, myself. And the final <laughs> question: freedom or money? Freedom. Ah, interesting. Wow. <laughs> Quite an interesting conversation with Dennis Njenga, who's the managing partner for Kaka Empire, the label, and also now the films. Quite an interesting, titillating conversation. Hope you've learned a thing or two about the music business. Looking forward to their new film that's coming out. It's called Monkey Business. And also some of the projects that they're doing and some of the brands that are actually is actually heading that's Femi One, King Kaka, and quite a number. He's told me there's one coming up on the line, yep, right? Yep. To yep. So thank you so much for having watched the show. Hope you've learned a thing or two from this particular conversation. As always, my name is Ian Dennis, coming to you live from the Capital Club, the place you need to be as an entrepreneur because at the Capital Club there's numerous amenities. Why we're actually filming this is actually one of the meeting rooms. There's a spa, there's a gym, there are 
there's a restaurant, literally you can eat, literally, literally, literally spend your full day here and also entertain your clients here. And also, of course, you can check out one of my new books, Food for Thought, it's actually out at Textbook Center, all the stores across Nairobi, as well as Nuria stores online. My name is Ian Dennis, and this has been the, the, the Late Night Business. See you next time right here on KTM.